Okay, what is this thing called prediabetes? If you're watching this, then most likely the fasting blood test I did in my office resulted in a level of glucose that's higher than normal. Um, an average human is supposed to come in and get some blood tests once a year. One blood test, the fasting again, that I mentioned is glucose. That's your sugar level, the sugar level in the bloodstream. When your sugar level is less than 100 or less, then you're normal, you're a normal human being. When you're 100 to 125, you're considered a pre-diabetic, and that's what I probably diagnosed you with. When you're 126 or above, that's full-blown diabetes. No one wants to hear you have diabetes, so I have a lot of people that I label as pre-diabetic asking for the fancier blood test, so I don't have a problem with doing it if your insurance will pay for it. But um, the fasting blood or the fasting hemoglobin A1C, if it's 5.7 to 6.4. That's just a percentage. Again, it's measuring your average sugars in your bloodstream over the last three months. If it's 5.7, 6.4, you're a pre-diabetic. Anything lower than that is uh, normal. If you're 6.5 and higher, then unfortunately you are a diabetic. So there's also a fancier test called oral glucose tolerance test. We used to do it for pregnant moms. It's a really cumbersome test. It takes two hours. You have to fast. You drink this big sugary drink and then we check your blood tests and if it's greater than 200 you're diabetic, if it's uh, 140 to 200, so uh, you're pre-diabetic. Anyway, the bottom line I think is whether we diagnose you as a pre-diabetic or a diabetic, you have to make lifestyle changes. If I'm concerned enough to do the fancier tests, then the likelihood is you have a high body mass index, you're not exercising, you have a high risk in the family of heart disease or you're smoking, or you have a high history in the family of diabetes, and I'm worried. And all I'm doing is getting blood tests to kind of push you into lifestyle change. When I have people that come in and uh, they're right on with their meditative practice or relaxation practice, when they're right on with their nutrition practice, when they're right on with their activities of the day, hey, uh, that's cool, as long as I can't find anything I'll see in a year. But unfortunately, my average American that comes in, usually has a risk factor and usually doesn't exercise like they're supposed to and usually eats poorly unfortunately that's and usually it's overweight this is a com commonplace problem in the United States and I think that I can empower people by giving them education but anyway the first thing is labeling and the, that's the shock part sometimes when you get shocked into saying into hearing now you have a di disease process then it makes you listen more and pay attention and then that drive of shock and uh, a, a being fear is usually a drive that will keep you going with a lifestyle change for a short time. But a sustainable lifestyle change, I think, is only, um, is only, you only get to that point if you're empowered to continue and notice the benefits and feel the benefits. So I usually will send people to registered dietitians and or exercise physiologists to educate and develop lifestyle change. So unfortunately, insurance doesn't cover most of the visits. In fact, if you're a diabetic, they'll cover two visits to a registered dietitian or a nurse educator, a diabetic educator in the first year, and then one visit a year after that. And uh, anybody who's been through a weight loss program, you're with a registered dietitian weekly for like 12 weeks. So I don't think a once a year visit is going to cut it, but that's all the insurance pays for. So you're really, you're really on your own. Um, but there's a lot of good information out there, and again, diabetes.org is a good way to start. There's a lot of good books out there. You have to shift, sift through everything, but if you get the right suggestions, you'll get to the point where you can make a lifestyle change. So education is important. This is what usually happens with diabetes. Usually when you eat, you have this food that you turn into a bolus by chewing it. That's digestion with chewing, digestion with uh, saliva, enzymes in the mouth, and then you swallow it. Gets into the stomach, into this pouch of hydrochloric acid, and then it further digests and churns the food so it turns it into chyme. Chyme is liquid nutrition. It breaks your uh, components of what you ate into carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. Those are the three basic macronutrients. It breaks it into that chyme so that it can be easily absorbed when it enters into the small intestine. That's 32 feet of tubing with these little finger-like projections that absorb nutrients out of the liquid that you just ate. 
over 36, 32 to 36, 36 feet, you should be able to take everything out and leave the residue. The unfortunate problem is most people don't eat enough fiber. So things come in pretty liquidy, things come in pretty processed. When you have processed food, your digestive system gets overwhelmed with a big amount of carbohydrates quickly. You're supposed to digest, digest, slowly with that kind of release protein, carbohydrates, fats into the bloodstream so the pancreas and the rest of the endocrine glands can either utilize them as energy or put them away as stored fat. When you overeat or when you eat things called high glycemic index foods, you digest and it suddenly releases carbohydrates, this is the theory now, it suddenly releases carbohydrates into the bloodstream and your bloodstream has to deal with a high amount and it can't. It, it just secretes a whole bunch of insulin and suddenly all at the same time to meet that high glycemic load that you just ate uh, and you're taken care of. But the problem is that insulin doesn't stop immediately so your body, continue, your pancreas continues to incre uh, secrete insulin into the bloodstream that then after about an hour has no carbohydrates. So you go through this thing called insulin dumping and then you feel lousy, you feel cravings, you feel headaches, you feel shakes and then you want to hunt for more carbohydrates to get the insulin back up again. So that's the cycle and I have a better explanation in the glycemic index video I did. But So this is why the type of food you select is very important. You always have to increase your fiber because fiber keeps food in and allows just a little bit of release of those macronutrients over the course of time, three to six hours. When you eat processed food, and this is what I wanted to show you with uh, this, these two food groups here. When I took over this office in Bartlett, uh, the waiting room had these safety pops. And I said, okay, well, that's fine, but the fact that there's a dentist across the hallway, I don't think we should be given safety pops. I don't like sugar for my kids anyway. So the, I wanted to show you what it makes it, how it makes a difference with calories and carbohydrates, which is what you pre-diabetics should be watching and empowering yourself to learn. These two safety pops are equal to about 85, 80 to 85 calories, all right? Now, average human being is allowed to have about, uh, if you don't have diabetes, up to 2,000. If you're trying to lose weight, about 1,500 calories in a day. If you're a diabetic, you've got to really cut it closer than that, 1,200. That's tight, but this has about 85. So, 85 calories here. Now, if you're a carb, that's out of your whole day. If you're a carb counter, this has about 22 grams of carbs. 22 grams of carbs when you're only allowed 20 to 50 a day, you've just, for those of you who are really tight on your carb measuring, you just knocked out everything you've eaten in a day into two little safety pops. That should be tossed out. That's the concept of eating bad carbohydrates. This is my usual uh, pack of deluxe roasted nuts from Archer Farm. Uh, I get it at Target. And this is about a quarter cup. This is equal to about 85 calories too. Same thing, 85 calories, 85 calories. But the carbohydrate content here is three versus that, 22. And there's also fiber in here that'll slow down the release. So, and this is also a little bit more volume than these little two things. So not only that, I've got oils in the nuts, I've got the, the lignans from the fiber. This is always obviously more healthy. And for me, it also keeps me awake. This is my grazing food that I usually go on to eat every three hours. It's not just this, it's a bunch of other things, but that's in another video. So the bottom line is, you can see how it's not just calories in, calories out. You can see the difference between these two as far as calories and carbohydrates. And that's what you have to be paying attention to. The foods that you eat, if they're high processed, like the uh, Dunkin' Donuts behind me or the McDonald's across the street, those foods have no nutritional value usually or very little nutritional value and they get released into the system very quickly so you go through insulin dumping. Uh, you have to be careful. And I have a lot of my college athletes who are really up to speed with their protein intake when they work out but then they go to the cafeteria eat crappy food when they're not working out and the muscles can tell. If you only give muscle high-end stuff once a day but you give it crappy food the other end of the day, well, what's the use? It all balances out in the long run. Same thing with my diabetics. If you are really strict with your dinner, but you're not so strict during the day, it's a 24-hour 
seven day a week kind of thing. You have to make the changes and it, even if this doesn't seem appetizing to you, there's a lot of other things that are flavorful, that are texture uh, intensive, that smell great, but you have to introduce yourself to it because the insulin dumping and the hormone release that you get with eating processed food and high sugar, it is somewhat of a buzz. It stimulates the dopamine centers in the brain to say, I like it. Uh, the dopamine centers in the brain are the same centers that respond to morphine. So you can see how bad food uh, and processed food is made in a way to make you happy for a short amount of time. But it's also made, like morphine, in a way to make you crash in a short amount of time. And when you crash, you'll be looking for more stuff because your brain and your hormones are searching. And this is that s typical setup of how you got to become a pre-diabetic and come to my office. So you, uh, hopefully in that little nutshell you see how uh, eating the wrong foods will e eventually get to the point where it, you pay for it. And it might take up to 10 years to 20 years, but most of my folks who are coming in at 40 to 50 years of age because of bad eating for the previous 10 to 20 years are now paying for it. If you aren't inspired to make a lifestyle change, then we start medicines. We'll start medicines like metformin to help make the insulin receptors in the cells take in insulin properly or take in sugar properly and lower your blood sugar. We'll maybe give you insulin. We'll give you a baby aspirin anticipating you're going to have a heart attack sooner or later. We'll start up an exercise regime and that's also very important too. Exercise is so important. There is uh, the, the, the cell, the, the single cell whether it's a muscle cell, a brain cell, a heart cell, only gets its energy by when insulin and sugar come together on the receptor or the surface of the cell and it allows glucose into the cell to be utilized as energy. There is a back door, kind of back access to muscle. When muscle is exercising, it doesn't need insulin around. It actually puts the sugar into the muscle to anticipate fight or flight if you're running from a tiger, you don't want to wait to see pancreas increase its insulin levels and allow sugar to be released and uh, allowed into the cell so you can take off and run. You want immediate acting. So there is a safety mechanism where if you exercise, it lowers your sugar. So daily exercise, and it doesn't have to be high intensity training. It doesn't have to be mixed martial arts. It doesn't have to be yoga, although I like all those uh, things. It just has to be some form of activity. So if you, you see the value of activity too, and I am assuming most of you are probably pressed for time. I'm not going to say couch potatoes, but pressed for time, working 50 hours a week, and you're taking care of your families on top of that. And no question, when you work 50 hours a week and you have 6 to 8 hours of sleep a night that you're supposed to be getting, there's not much time to do, go to the gym and do an hour to two hours of exercise. And it's not inspiring, especially when you're tired and hungry at the end of the day. So sometimes, and that's why it's important to see an exercise physiologist to design exercise routines that are sustainable for you. Everybody has different tastes, ethnicities, uh, cooking skills as far as nutrition practice. Well, everybody has different body types, uh, sports, loves, um, interests. So it, it takes a professional or somebody with good knowledge, vast knowledge, to design an exercise routine. It's not just go back to the gym and do powerlifting exercises. That's not the way it is, but unfortunately that's the way most of my guys understand exercise. Go to the gym, lift weights. It's more than that. In fact, that'll probably get you hurt. And most of my guys that do lift weights and are being called pre-diabetics now, though all that weightlifting didn't help at all. So it really, uh, it, it takes designing an exercise routine that you love for it to be sustainable. And I think exercise physiologists are great in that realm. Uh, or if you can't afford an exercise physiologist, go to a physical therapist. I can usually find a problem with a body part with most of my patients and that will usually entitle you to going to a physical therapist at least once. And sometimes my good physical therapists will be able to not only take care of the body part dysfunction, but also be able to design an exercise routine that won't flare up that body part anymore. So you see everybody's a little different. If you have bad knees, if you have a bad back, if you have flat feet, if you have trigger points in the neck, if you have chronic headaches, everything's a little different, it, depending on even your weight, if you have skin problems. So it takes somebody uh, a couple visits to figure this thing out, and that's why I like sending people to physical therapists or using exercise physiologists. It's not just one visit with me and then your life has changed, obviously. I can set the 
the baseline groundwork, but you have to go see my coaches, my eyes in the field to continue developing lifestyle change that's sustainable. The other thing is relaxation. I think it's very important to uh, be prepared for stress. And I know most of you that I've seen in the office will say, I don't have any stress. Well, guess what? They usually have an associated high blood pressure problem too, and I'm not going to talk about that in this video, but even if you don't have stress, I, that's why I think it's nice the way Andy Wow uh, refers to it as uh, stress preparation. Driving in a two-lane highway, driving on the left is usually riddled with a little bit of stress because there's always going to be somebody that comes up on your bumper and wants to pass you, flashes the lights, or there's going to be traffic, or there's going to be a backed up schedule, or you're going to be late for work, or you're going to have an alarm clock that sounds too loud, or you're not going to have enough food at the right time. These are all stressors. Having an infection is a stressor. So don't just think of stress as um, being slapped in the face or uh, being held up in downtown Chicago. Stressors, uh, those invisible stressors are the ones that cause the problems with inflammation. The inflammation is di directly linked to prediabetes. So if you can control the inflammatory reaction with relaxation practice of some sort, and I'll put the 478 breath technique in my hiking uh, um, practices I've done before, if you can control the stress response, if you can control the the activity you do per week, per day, if you can control the nutrition practice, you're on your way. That's the, those are the basic building blocks to making a lifestyle change. Now, whether that's sustainable or not, if you stumble, you come back in and see me. That's why I like to see my pre-diabetics every three to six months. It does seem cumbersome, but if I can get you on the straight and narrow, and you can reverse this, you'll not only take away your problems with pre-diabetes and turning into diabetes, you also take away your risk for a heart attack, take away your risk for a, an irreversible cancer, take away your risk for stroke, all of these things are great. You make your love life better, you make your problem solving faster, you'll be able to be more productive, and then you'll blossom into other things. And then you'll reflect on your family or everybody else around you to even uh, uh, raise the bar of uh, living or existing. So I think it just is, is so important to empower my patients to understand, and it starts with understanding the disease process. And I gave it to you in a nutshell, but you can find more with reading. Understand what you're up against with fast food communities and the candy industry. Understand what you're up against as far as a 50-hour work week and um, TV being so tempting to sit there and just watch your one-hour to two-hour program and eat food mindlessly. And I think that's where it all starts. I, I think watching TV or being sucked into these reality shows, getting on your iPad in the middle of the night, not reading a good book, uh, not being social. I think social activities are also very important with decreasing the inflammatory reaction. All these things all help. Uh, I always like to think about where in the, uh, in the world people can live to 100 and be productive. That would be Okinawa, that would be Sardinia. Uh, the Blue Zones by Dan Buettner is a great book if, you have, uh, uh, if you're a book reader. But it, it shows you how to get to those ages and be productive without much disease. And it can be applied to those lifestyle changes, which is usually family, eating, activity, some form of, of love or fun. Those things can be done even in today's activity, but you have to kind of remove yourself from or unplug yourself or give yourself a, a news fast, a noise fast, um, um, a, a friend fast. Sometimes you have to defriend yourself or unfriend yourself and then uh, change or take into some other uh, activity you never did before. Those things usually help to make your lifestyle change. Everybody's a little different. It always takes planning, but I think, again, by giving you a label of prediabetes, I don't look at it as a bad disease, I look at it as an opportunity to make a lifestyle change which will probably help you beat the other things that are coming in your life.